I'll be speaking speaking first and then handing over to Tony. And we're talking about ontological mapping. Um, me in terms of space, time and loss. And then Tony uh, is going to talk about mapping the future. Okay. So what I want to put forward is um, mapping as designing, not so much the relation between mapping and design, nor the use of mapping within design, but the stronger claim that mapping, that is making maps and using maps, is in fact a designing force. Um, the context for this is the sort of changes that have occurred in, the early, in this early 21st century, in which mapping has moved way beyond spatiality and physical geography and has diversified um, technologically in the digital era. It's migrated across many disciplines. Um, and this is something that kind of came to my attention about 10 years ago, is suddenly the word mapping was appearing everywhere, you know, cultural mapping, mapping social networks, mapping the inside of the body, mapping the genome, mind mapping, cultural mapping, conversation mapping, and so on. And, and some of that, actually, when you look into it, is quite weak in the, that it's really just kind of gesturing to mapping, um, using mapping as a metaphor, um, or redescribing modes of visual representation and diagramming as mapping. Um, but that's not that that's necessarily a problem. Um, but at another level, the, the kind of distinction between, say, map, diagram, plan, and visualization has definitely blurred. Um, and mapping has become a label for some almost analyzing and giving visual form to, to data. And of course, the other reason that's happened is this, if you like, mapping explosion is because of um, this, or this mapping expansion, it's been driven by the availability of vast amounts of data, of all kinds of data that actually lend themselves to be analyzed and presented visually. Um, but then the, the real clincher has been the proliferation of mobile devices that are all um, locatable you know, via satellite, which allows, if you like, mapping in real time. Um, and therefore the collapsing together of what were once distinct activities um, of, say, mapping, navigating and tracking, they all become simultaneous. Um, and in that way, mapping um, as an idea and a practice has become dynamic. It emphasizes movement rather than fixed locations and processes rather than places and time as well as space. Now, while the static traditional map prefigured actions in and on worlds, and in fact was a force of world, world making and world taking away, I'll say more of that in a minute, um, it wasn't instantaneous in the way that mapping is now. It didn't operate in real time um, as, as, as allowed by you know, GPS navigation, etc. now. In fact, you could say that what we have now is, is the capacity to do instant mapping. Um, and in that sense, map and territory become one, almost a realization of the Borgesian image of the map that exactly corresponds to its territory, um, except that the correspondence is not so much spatial, it's temporal. Um, the blue or red dot that slides across the screen in sync with the track target which in the track target being you walking on the street or you in your car. And while the map is still there um, as part of the navigation system, as an electronic image of lines, place names and landmarks, mostly it's superfluous to navigation as it's being displaced by audio instructions that are telling you, go here, go there, turn left, turn right. Okay. Now these sorts of developments we, uh, of course, many people um, seek to understand them technologically, and that's important, and I wouldn't claim that as my particular area of expertise, but certainly they have to be understood beyond the technological. Um, and I argue they need to be considered ontologically in the way in which these um, developments within digital, digital um, technologies and practice create new ways of being in time and space 
And in this, that particular example of, say, satellite, um, um, the satellite track driver or pedestrian, is that that subject no longer needs to figure out where, where they are and where they're going because that's being done for them by the technology that they're using. So you can always say, what does it mean to be lost now? In fact, um, in fact, one is not lost, um, one is guided. And in that sense, something like a sense of direction becomes redundant. And as geolocation devices and applications render almost anywhere instantly navigate, navigable and usable, you could ask, does that expand opportunities for encountering and learning from the unfamiliar? Or does it simply reinforce the familiar because it can so easily be located in the unfamiliar? Okay. So as, as digital technologies continually enable more, the impression is one of opening up of more information, more options, more accessibility, more transparency, more visibility. But what that does is that obscures that what is actually going on is an induction into a particular way of knowing and being in the world. One that as it gathers momentum becomes indispensable, displacing other ways of knowing and being in worlds. And this in fact is the ontological designing of technology as it designs its users, us. Now to say these things about um, real-time mapping, about instant mapping, I'm not saying those as an expression of nostalgia for static traditional hard copy maps, even though I really love them. Um, it's more that because the point about those maps is they're certainly not innocent. The static map also has designing agency. It induced particular modes of knowing and acting as a subject who was capable or of mentally correlating lines and markings on a two-dimensional diagram to the landscape and streets and building through which their body is moving. Um, historically and culturally though, static maps also design subjectivities as they prefigure certain kinds of movements, sightseeing, scenic drives, history walks and so on. And then we could also link that to wayfinding as a sort of subgenre of design and the way in which places are um, heavily designed as part of the notion of experience design of you know even more extreme forms of prefiguration. Um, okay but the point is that in the shift from the static map to mobile instantaneous mapping there is this continuity of designing agency of these design things that design us. Most of the time, we're not aware of that in the sense that people think of themselves as users, as this has been convenient and whatever. Um, but the difference usually is, is what it is that is being designed. There is a way in which the designing of design cannot be escaped from. Um, now, to looking at um, map, map making historically, obviously, um, the point has to be made that it was map making was absolutely indispensable to colonialism's project of conquest and control. That the map was central to the very concept of the nation state and its operation. And in that way, map making is always directive, it's always interested, it's never neutral. It makes sense of and orders as a prelude to taking control, and maps generate movement. In, um, in his book, um, A History of Spaces, which is about cartographic reason, mapping in a geocoded world, John Pickles um, has argued against, you know, this is one of those classic books, against the common sense notion of a map merely representing something that already exists. And he says that a map anticipated, anticipates social reality, not vice versa, and that in his history, he shows that a map was a model for rather than a model of what it purported to represent. It had become a real instrument to concretize projections on the Earth's surface. So maps prefigured movement. 
defining and locating features of territory, opening up for all kinds of occupation and use. This is their designing power. Conventionally, surveying and map making were considered prior to and separate from the prefigured acts of planning and designing. However, historically, the plan preceded the map, and this was the case for many cities, ancient and modern, especially for fortress and colonial cities. Um, okay. And historically, um, things, certain conventions of, um, of geometry underpinned both cartography um, and modern urban form, the plan of the city. So that mapping and planning often occur simultaneously. A site is surveyed, the survey produces the information from which to make the map. The map opens the possibility of a plan, or maybe the mapping's only occurred because the intention is to make a plan. And of course, plans always look to the future. A plan enfolds action and change. A plan is a map projected forward in time, and it says, this is what will be, or this is what is here now, and this is how it will be at some point in the future. In that way, a plan is always a design. Now this closeness of mapping, surveying, planning and designing shows that maps are always interested. Yes, they might show topographical features or, um, or, or constructions and built, built structures that can be correlated by ground truthing, by walking over grounds and saying, yes, there's definitely this line of trees here and so forth. But then, of course, it's why is this particular place being mapped? What is the impositional intent? And mostly it's an intention, intention to occupy and to make use of the extraction of minerals, the clearing of habitat, subdivision for real estate, building roads, ports, railways, whatever. So thinking of the site map, a site map is a mapping of things that are already obliterated. And within the design professions, the move from mapping to, to designing is very fast. That mapping is in fact a preparation for designing and it can be done in a very cursory way, simply identifying site constraints on what is to be built. Or in fact, it can open up to the unexpected and thereby modify what it is that's built. And in fact, more sensitive fine grained mapping can inform the direction and character of the final design. But even if it does, it's unlikely to result in leaving things as they are because the mapping itself is already framed by a prior decision that change will occur. Now, historically, a spatial paradigm ruled surveying and map, mapping, map making and the activities that followed, like building roads and so forth. And to the surveyor and the cartographer in the service of capital and colonial power, if you like, space was, uh, was limitless. It was there to be mapped and claimed and surveyed and occupied and built upon. And the traditional survey map in that way conceals time. It plots out locations in space as if time was of no consequence, as if what it describes always existed and will always exist. Yet spaces are mapped as a precursor to change. Thus maps were, and in fact are, catalysts for ending the time of one thing and inaugurating the time of what is to come. Now in our time, time in fact has come to the fore in mapping and this is dramatically evident in the visualisations of the crucial issue of our time of climate change. The visualisations presented the maps, the maps of futures of the um, International Panel on Climate Change, uh, which is based upon thousands of scientists or allied with the work of thousands of scientists who are now mapping what is disappearing, the changing distribution of species and habitats, the rates of clearing of, of forests, the, um, the shrinking of the north and south, the ice of the north and south pole, the drying up of rivers, the increases in temperatures, 
the and many other phenomena. And if you like, their mapping almost can't keep pace with the speed of loss. And that's where there is connection between, if you like, traditional mapping and mapping now. And if you like, it's a tragic connection because you could say all this urgent temporal mapping is occurring now because of the centuries of spatial mapping that conceived of Earth, land and sea as boundless space to be occupied, as bounty to be reaped. In other words, mapping as a neutral spatial practice or misrecognized as such has been an agent of the taking away of time. And this in the largest sense is what the map has designed. And the implication of that is that risk mapping now overshadows all mapping. And um, we can then ask what are the implications for a critical practice of designing that is aware of that history and that present. And this is the point at which I'll uh, move over to Tony and he'll take up that point. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, just to put what I'm going to say in context, uh, we are, I believe, as a species, at the beginning of uh, a completely new epoch of human occupation, planetary occupation. Uh, initially, we were distributed around the world as a species by two forces, the cha a, cha a changing climate and the search for food. We've now reached a point where we're going to replicate that dynamic. Uh, the implication of what I'm saying is over the next few hundred years, I would argue that the human population is going to be redistributed around the world. Uh, and I'm just going to put that to you as the background of what I'm going to say in relation to how we think about mapping and the future. So all conventional maps are now becoming increasingly diachronically and spatially disjunctive. As such, they are out of date and out of place. Increasingly, they are failing to represent what they purport to show. As a result of a change in climate, there is a discernible drift from the from relative stability of the global geophysical state of being to one of increasing instability. Sea levels are rising, coastlines are changing, polar ice caps are disappearing, new deserts are in the process of forming, forests are continually being lost, rivers will run and are running dry, settlements, towns and cities will be and are being abandoned, destroyed, and populations will be or are already being displaced, borders will blur and transgressed. Unfortunately, sadly, conflict is going to increase. Today, in the news, there is a conflict between uh, Iran and Afghanistan over a river. This kind of event is now commonplace around the world. So this isn't a dystopic picture I'm presenting. This is simply reporting what the IPCC uh, is really evaluating in relation to the impacts of global warming. The, the 13 climate models that they have reviewed recently uh, are indicating that climate warming is going to continue to uh, 2300 and beyond. The, the upward trend is not going to cease. The, there is a revision from a 1.5 global warming expectation to the end of the century revised up to 2.7. Against this backdrop, there are two perspectives to register. The change of the 
outer world, the world that we observe, and the change of the inner world that we all occupy within ourselves. So you have to bring our change into the picture. So the, the outer, what can be seen, what can be experienced, what can be mapped as a dynamic mapping in time. So three or four different levels. The first, the global using the equator as an example. The, the, the equator is a line cutting through the Indonesian archipelago, Central Africa and the north of South America. Its heat will draw a death line. The Nigerian city of Lagos, just north of the equator, is projected to have a population of 80 million people by 2100. Currently, it is a place of flight. People are going there. The informal is growing dramatically, but it's going to reverse. It is going to be a place to flee from, and that's going to be replicated in cities across all of those regions that I've just mentioned. And I'm going to move to the next one, which is an example, the Indonesian uh, capital of Jakarta. It's a sinking city with a population of more than 30 million. It's, it's exposed to threats from flooding and sea level rises, to pollution, earthquakes, overpopulation. It's a delta city that was built on low, flat, alluvial uh, land, prone to flooding in the monsoon season. Over 40% of the city is below sea level. The city has sunk four meters, four meters in the last 20 years. As a result, the government decided to move the capital from Jakarta in uh, that part of the archipelago to Kalimantan, Borneo, uh, which is in the center geographically of the archipelago. And uh, a new city is being built there, uh, but problematically, uh, Kalimantan was chosen for its central position. The name of the new city is uh, Nantara, uh, and it will cause major environmental problems. Uh, the construction is underway. It has meant clearing vast areas of flora and fauna from rich tropical rainforests. The ongoing impact of this development is huge. Uh, it is actually a major problem for the Dayaks, the indigenous people of the area who've been displaced. Uh, they are in a conflictual relation with the people that are arriving. Uh, and the city uh, is due to be completed in 2020, uh, 2045. So it's symptomatic of not just one place, but numerous places. The phenomena of sinking cities is now commonplace. Again, last week, uh, there was a publication indicating that six major cities in the US are sinking, including New York. New York have a plan to relocate 40% of the city, uh, and that, that is already being worked on. So that was a global in relation to the equator, regional in relation to Indonesia, now my local, Australia. Uh, a couple of examples, Marble Bar, uh, a small mining town in Western Australia. It's uh, really a situation where its population is being burnt out of existence. Over a period of 160 days in 2022, the lowest temperature was 37.5 degrees centigrade, the highest over 50 degrees centigrade. One example. In um, it is somewhere that's becoming uninhabitable. And then the next one's a small city called Lismore in New South Wales, 734 kilometres north of Sydney, with a population of 27,000. 
In 2021, it was flooded three times as a result of stream weather. In 2022, light woods, likewise three times. In the last flood in, in the March, the, rose, the water rose 14.5 metres. This was the worst flood in Australian history. Effectively, it destroyed the city. Buildings were simply washed away. So this is the background to the kind of work that I'm working on in relation to the relocation of settlement, the relocation of population. Really, uh, it has an enormous impact upon people. So I'm now moving to the inner, the, the massive force of ontological change that comes with climate change. So, as I said when I started, climate redistributed the population around the world. It was an evolutionary force, as a result of which the colour of our skin changed, our diet changed, our forms of shelter changed, what we wore changed, but also our psychology changed. And this, I'm suggesting, is going to be repeated. Now, the Japanese philosopher Watsho Tazuro determined that the only way that we know climate is, is experientially. And what he meant by that is that if you take the example of cold, it doesn't matter how much data you have, it doesn't matter how much information you have, you only understand cold by being cold. So the experiential dimension of climate change is absolutely crucial to contemplate as a driving force and as a transforming force of what we are. Effectively, the situation that we're in is no matter where we are, no matter what our economic situation is, no matter what technological means that we have, we have to adapt. And increasingly, that's going to confront us dramatically. If we don't adapt, we're going to die. So internally uh, and globally, mass relocation will change where we are, how we are, where we will live. Many agricultural systems are going to fall. Nations are going to fall. Major cities are going to be lost. Borders will be redrawn. Conflict, as I've already said, will increase. And there is a possibility that our species itself might start to fragment. Here are just three crude scenarios. A significant part of the global population are simply going to be abandoned. Uh, at the other extreme, there will be a privileged techno-immune part of the global population. And in between the two, there will be a pluriversality of bricolage of the adapting masses striving to survive however they can. So really what I'm saying, what the implication is, is ontologically, we are not going to stay as we are. Climate change is an absolutely massive, massive ontological designing, transforming force. And the descriptions that we have of it presented to us are not communicating that in any significant way. The, the signs and the trends are already present. How they will unfold with what relational consequence is still unclear. But what is evident is that we are all becoming unsettled. And this, as I've said, is going to increase physically and psychologically. The nation states will be under enormous stress, as will natural resources. The environmental, climatic and biophysical impacts will increase. The degree of severity of the situation will be determined and be prefigured 
and prevented action may improve the situation, but it's not going to stop it. As the IPCC have made clear, climate change is irreversible. So acting in time, the medium of time, acting with a sage of urgency is absolutely critical. It cannot simply be instrumental. It demands action upon ourselves to change our modes of being in the world. So, in a sense, we are the first things that have to respond. We have to be able to ontologically transform how we occupy the world. Uh, and this demands really transforming how we see ourselves and how we see the world. We occupy not just a physical ecology, a biophysical ecology, but also an ecology of images. How we see the world has enormous impact upon how we act in the world. So one of the designing imperatives is actually to change how we represent the world that we see because it acts back on us. Our seeing is a result of instruction. The instructions have to change. So, what we in our difference do, what we make, how we live, all ontogenetically determine what we will become. This recursive process has brought us to the moment that we're in at the moment but it also determines our future. So the group that I'm working on, working with, is working on the notion of vector mapping. Mapping that isn't about representing things uh, in a fixed extent, but representing things as constant change. Uh, and that is a conversation that uh, it would be uh, worth kind of developing. I'm, I don't know in terms of who of you are listening um, are familiar with vector, vector mapping, but, but I think it is something that is actually critical in terms of being able to make present what it is that we have to confront. So that's me. Thank you.